Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Todd Bayless, Principal, Deloitte Consulting, LLP. Awesome. All right, how is everybody doing? I'm gonna come this way. Thank you very much. We, uh, we have an exciting panel for you today. We have some great panelists. You can see their pictures there, but um, more important, uh, we should probably call them out. So why don't we bring our panelists out? We have some awesome fluffy chairs to sit in. I'm not sure why we're so far away. <laughs> I guess that amps up the types of questions I could ask. I could be a little more controversial because um, they're pretty far away from me. Anyway, today's panel is the future of smart entertainment, consumers in control. We're going to talk about you know, what's going on in today's entertainment um, ecosystem. And, and most importantly, we're going to put a lens on it um, that is specific to consumers and, and the fact that in today's world, um, with over-the-top video, with the proliferation of devices, with these massive networks that are available to us today, with massive amounts of bandwidth, uh, we get a ton more flexibility in how we decide what we watch or listen to, when we watch it, um, or listen to, and how. So why don't we have the panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with David, and we'll work on our way down to um, Selena. Great. Well, thank you, uh, David Beck. I'm the EVP of Corporate Strategy and Operations at Turner. I uh, spend a lot of my time and team's time right now focused on um, the future of where Warner Media, along with AT&T, are, are going to be headed. A lot of that relates to our big direct-to-consumer offering that we're going to be uh, releasing in Q4. Um, and we're spending a lot of time in this panel today talking about consumer insights, and that's, a, again, another area that we spend a, a lot of focus on, is understanding what consumers really want in, uh, in this world of media today. Thanks. Um, I'm Jeff Hughes. I'm the president of uh, the Digital Consumer Group uh, at Fox. Uh, we were set up basically to look at this very problem, which is what do the actual end users want? And let's try to make sure that we get that to them rather than thinking about only what our distribution partners might want. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting time. We spend all of our time thinking about uh, what's going to come next and how we should position ourselves and our partners to make sure we're successful in the, in the digital age. Hi, I'm Peter Naylor. I run advertising sales at Hulu. And uh, as you may know, Hulu has the ad-supported version of our service as well as an ad-free version of our service. And uh, the majority of people, thankfully, take the ads. And I'm responsible for monetizing that opportunity. Hi, Selena Adcock. I lead our partnerships with streaming partners such as Hulu and Netflix across the board and help them build their businesses on Facebook. Awesome. So today's format, we're going to ask uh, questions to the panelists. I'm sure you expect that. That's for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we will take 10 minutes at the end where um, we will take questions from, from you folks, uh, which we will you know, ask of our esteemed panelists. And, and um, we hope you, you come up with something far harder than I'm going to ask. So um, think about that as you listen to what they say. We're going to start with David. Uh, David alluded to the fact that you know, Warner Media team has been working on some research. Um, to talk about what consumers want, or at least to delve into what consumers want. And I think you said you're going to launch that in Q4? Uh, that's correct. All right, so if there's any highlights you want to give us now, maybe a little teaser around uh, what, you, what you're seeing. I don't think so. No? <laughs> no, but it's I can talk to you about, you know, I mean, again, if we are going to be launching, others in the space are launching services, it is going to be a crowded space uh, before the end of this year. And as we, uh, as we think about that, we really wanted to understand what the consumers are actually looking for and the pain points that they're, they're having in the D2C SVOD space. And time and time again in our qual and quant, uh, and very recent qual and quant research, we're seeing that people still fundamentally have trouble in the what is it that I'm going to watch and how do I get it, right? And that decision process. And a lot of that comes down to two main things when we double clicked into why. It's the recommendations that they're getting uh, and the search functionality. So are they really getting relevant recommendations? And a good example would be, you know, a lot of people co-view content, you know, whether it's your spouse, your wife, your brother, your sister, whoever, you're sitting there watching content together, trying to decide, but you've got one profile that's been activated and you're getting one set of recommendations versus perhaps three or four that are sitting down. So the ability to, 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 to blend recommendations based on profiles, fairly simple thought, but at the same rate, could have a very different impact on reducing the time to discovering and find that content. On the search side, you know, search is still uh, a little cumbersome. Um, when you think about, oh, I love watching a comedy, 
Do I want to see a dark comedy like Barry on HBO or Search Party on TBS? Or are I looking something light, you know, like uh, The Last OG or uh, Rick and Morty? Fundamentally different sets of content choices, yet still within a genre. So the ability to really start to dive down and get granular in search. It was just two examples of things that time and time again, uh, consumers are saying, we really want this. It hasn't been solved at scale everywhere. Yeah. And, and we really need to work on that as an industry. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to go past that a little bit, and I think yourself and, and maybe Jeff, because um, we, we were, you know, discovery is obviously a very hot topic. And um, I look at that problem, and traditionally, um, you know, and, and most people talk about discovery within a given service, uh, but certainly over, the, I think, the last five, six years, there have been more than a couple startups and big companies that have tried to do federated search and, and aggregated search and tried to enable discovery across all the different services that are out there. And um, I think we all see that as, as a huge need. If I want to watch a piece of content, um, the last thing I want to do is, is go to 13 places to go and try to find who actually owns the rights for the device that I want to go see it on. So do you guys have any ideas, thoughts, considerations around federated search? And is that really practical, um, something that we could accomplish? Or is that you know, this pipe dream that we, that's going to take forever to get to? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, it, it's an interesting problem. I mean, we've already come a long way. There's, there's um, one of the things that we, we try to do is connect the rights so that you could go to one place to see at least a single show from start to, to, mm -hmm. start to finish. You didn't have to jump around. Um, I think that uh, it's a difficult problem because as things begin to unbundle and, and rebundle and as we go through that process, there's going to be a, a bit of an atomization um, across, the, across the ecosystem uh, and I think right now, uh, most of the providers that own the data want to hold on to the data. They view that as strategic, quite rightly, um, and are trying to figure out how to best monetize that, and therefore they don't share across, which makes search difficult, um, very, very difficult, uh, and discovery very, very difficult. And I'm not sure that's going to be solved in the very, very near term, but I think it, you've already got you know, some, of the, some of the searches that you referred to earlier that are, that are going across different platforms, but it's, it's almost not perfect, and it's only content. And I believe that you know, recommendations and search needs to take into account the profile, who's watching, when they're watching, how they're watching, because people don't want to watch the same thing at 9 o'clock in the morning that they want to watch at 8 o'clock in the evening. And therefore, you know, getting it right means you have to have all of the data. And I think that's where companies that own the data stop sharing, which makes the problem difficult. I know I haven't answered the question as to how it's going to be solved, but I have clearly articulated that it's hard. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. You definitely did. Let's, uh, let's jump a little bit down the road and, and go to Peter. Um, and obviously, we all know that, that not only is Hulu a great product, um, but they're spending a lot of time in innovating in advertising and the different types of ad products that are out there. Uh, we think of advertising and we think of usually just standard ad pods with 30 second ads or 15 second ads. But um, Peter, le let us know what you're doing. Um, to change the perspective on that and um, to avoid, you know, the, the, the challenges around people just saying, I don't like ads and going yeah, somewhere else. I mean, I think um, when people observe, oh, no one likes ads, I don't think that's true. I think um, people are fine with ads. Nobody likes irrelevance. So I think uh, relevance is really the name of the game. So when you're talking about the ad experience, again, we have an ad-supported Hulu and an ad-free Hulu. And the nice thing about that is when people sign up and they're given that choice, they're making that, that choice and that decision to choose the ad-supported Hulu. And uh, cognitive dissonance says that they're going to pay more attention when they've made a choice. Um, now, that doesn't mean we can take advantage of the fact, well, they said they wanted ads, so let's just serve them a ton of ads. If anything, we have to be more respectful of that choice because we know they're just one click away from going to the ad free version of Hulu. I mean, when we think about the ad experience, there's things that we can do to optimize it behind the scenes that the viewer won't see. For example, uh, making sure the ad experience is consistent as we can possibly make it everywhere, irrespective of the screen. Um, making sure that the frequency caps are adhered to, just making sure all of our rules and logic is bulletproof in the ad server. And then for the things that they do see, you know, most of our advertisers are television advertisers, so most of the times they're happy to give us 15 and 30 second spots. We're happy to take it, but it really doesn't under, uh, it, it really doesn't exploit the opportunity for connected TV. Now, 100% of our viewing is through an IP address. So anything you can almost imagine doing in a browser space creatively, we can do in a TV space. 
So we work and are happy to partner with companies like Brightline and Innovid who have interactive ads. We've done ad executions where um, you know, you see a movie trailer and you can click and it activates your Fandango app. Uh, we have a RFI ad where you click and it, uh, it, it causes a, uh, a text to be sent, so a RFI, a request for information. Um, the other nice thing about being an on-demand service, you're not married to a clock. You're not married to having 15s and 30s because you have to start and stop at the top and the bottom of the hour. So any ad length is, is welcome. Um, and my favorite example that's really fresh is Farmers, Farmers Insurance. Uh, they have done a really nice execution of sequential ads. So we gave them the A position in three cons consecutive breaks in, a, in an episode. And they did a, a 30, a 15, and a 30, and it tells a whole story. So the formats that we've all become comfortable with in TV are totally welcome here, but I think the opportunity it's almost an imperative that marketers take advantage of the, of the fact that they can really play around and get the consumer's attention. And just if I could ask you to expand on one thing, which is um, certainly this innovation, uh, you and your team are working on innovating, and I guess the, um, the agencies and the brands also have a role in that. So as it relates to new products, as it relates to trying to do something more progressive and more interesting um, in the definition of a campaign, how much of it is your team versus how much of it is the agency and the brand at this time coming to you with you know, some kind of new idea? And, and maybe even highlight a little bit about the interplay between your engineering team. We might have to build something specific for it. How does that all work at the end of the day? Yeah, you uncovered the fact that um, it takes a lot of stakeholders to do something other than, well, we're gonna run this campaign everywhere. You know, uh, a lot of times you get the question, is the juice worth the squeeze to go through all this trouble? Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, our reach keeps increasing, so it's easier to justify the effort. Um, most times, we're evangelizing about the opportunity, and you find someone who really wants to do something. So in the case of the farmer's ad I gave you an example was, with it was client-driven, executed by the creative agency, purchased by the uh, media agency, all with our input. So we can be helpful with our integrated marketing solutions, but more often than not, the brand is like, you know what, we want to really have a firm hand on the wheel. So RPA was the creative agency, Zenith was the media agency, and it started with a pitch of like, you're not exploiting this correctly, and it's up to those people saying, all right, am I gonna take my hardworking media dollars and, and put it against creative? And the researchers have to weigh off, is this going to be worth it? And, uh, you know, I feel like when they, when they go through with it, it gets the attention that everybody wants. And that's what we want. I mean, these ads are designed to move people's businesses forward. And I think when you get the attention of consumers, that opportunity just skyrockets. Well, that's, that's great. And with respects to farmers, I think it's working. Because you say farmers, and I just think of J.K. Simmons, and I just want to go, we are farmers. Bum, ba, da, bum, 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 bum. The funniest thing about this creative is he's in it, and they kind of break their format, and they wink to the audience, and they reference the fact that, well, aren't we going to go and see the situation? He's like, oh, yeah, this is a con to be continued <laughs> ad. And then to be continued pops up on the screen. He goes, see, look, it'll be continued. Like, it really winks at the audience, like, we know we're giving you an ad, you know you're watching an ad, we know you're familiar with our creative, so it was really elegantly done. Awesome. And to add to that, to tie back to when we were talking about discovery, in the world of amazing ad tech platforms like Hulu, like Facebook, and the ones that are to come, once the ad tech gets so good and data and information can find the right person with the right content, that frees up the agencies and the brands to create great to create great content. So we are actually hopefully doing the brands and agencies a favor by making the media delivery much more seamless, relevant, and timely, and getting the right content into the right person in this world where the Netflixes of the world are creating 900 pieces of content, which you can't even watch one piece of content every day for the next three years. And I think it's really interesting to hear how those brands will face that challenge, but also overcome it, and we can help. But most important is, uh, we, you know, I hear a lot of our big media um, clients talk about the fact that, you know, 
the cat's out of the bag. They, they spent a lot of time licensing all of their libraries to these big companies um, or to these companies that, that they didn't know were going to turn around and potentially be such a challenge. And uh, what we see now is obviously direct-to-consumer strategies that are being deployed. We see companies like the Walt Disney Company, uh, Warner Media reorganizing part of their teams to have direct-to-consumer organizations. And, um, and with that, they're talking about pulling back all this content and those licensing deals. So, you know, Disney will take Marvel out of Netflix eventually and they'll just bring it right back into Disney Plus and make you pay a certain amount per month from them from it as opposed to going there. Do you think that these, these big streaming providers um, can really survive um, without licensing content from the Walt Disney Company and, and Warner Media and Fox and others? Yeah, well, Netflix and Hulu have already proven that they can create sustaining platforms by catering to their consumers with high quality content, on-demand content, and exclusive content. As I had mentioned earlier, Netflix created 900 originals this year. Hulu just announced that they have 25 million subscribers, so it is working. The challenge that will happen in the community, in our industry, as we, the Turners of the World, the Walt Disney's and Apple's get into this space, is how many subscriptions are consumers going to sign up for. So raise of hands in the audience, how many of you have three or more streaming services that you have signed up for? And this is great, because this is actually more than I expected, but we all are here for a reason, right? One, uh, two years ago, most people only had one streaming service. Over the last two years, people who have three or more have gone up eightfold. So we're just in this beginning space where the people who are coming in now, the new entrants, are going to have to convince us why we should have one more subscription. And most American households only have $125 to spend on entertainment. So there will be trade-off decisions. As an industry, we're gonna have to figure out what those bundles look like or what that looks like. Where we used to have cable and we had 500 different outlets, is there gonna be just five outlets that we're getting all of our content through? And all of us up here are responsible for helping create what that looks like. So just an interesting challenge as we move forward. And if we all knew that, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. But it's fun to be able to be in the seat where we get to create that. Awesome. Jeff, do you want to continue that, your thoughts on bundling? We see this great big unbundling. Are we going to see the rebundling of content in the future? Yeah, I think, I, I think you're going to see a little bit of both. So the way I think about it is, you know, if you had a big ball of little magnets and you threw it on the ground and they just scattered everywhere, they would quickly regroup in smaller and smaller groups. And I think that what you're going to see, virtually every big content producer that exists today uh, has said that they're going to they're launch direct-to-consumer products. Um, we have, others have, uh, and, it's, and, and there will be new entrants and all the big tech companies are doing it. And I think uh, that if you try to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer, they don't necessarily want to have 15 subscriptions, but they do want to have access to most of the content so that they can find it and, and consume what they want to consume. And I think there, there, there's going to be two things that happen. One, I, do don't, I don't believe personally that the big bundle is going to go away. I just think it'll go from 80% penetration to something in the 55 to 60%, which is not enough to sustain the current levels of content creation that the big like, companies like us do now. And therefore, we have to find other ways to monetize that. And one of the ways will be going direct to consumer. And other ways will be to bundle not only with other types of content, but with other types of services. So if I'm a, if I'm a video provider or a, or a content provider and I can track what you're doing and when you're doing it and who you're doing it with, I think there's other ways to monetize that. If it's, a, if it's sporting, maybe it's ticketing. If it's, a, if it's drama, maybe there's there's some experiential type uh, things that you can get into, there's music. And I think more and more all of us on this stage will be looking at how do we monetize the content outside of the screen as well as inside of the screen. But from a, from a pure content point of view, I do think there are companies like Hulu and, and maybe Amazon that are going to be really good at getting people on their platform so the consumer can quickly choose so they actually don't have, they, they don't feel like they have 15 services. They might actually have them, but they won't feel like they have them. And they'll just, they'll just put them together very, very quickly. And then there'll be the traditional distribution outlets today that just let you subscribe to everything. And I think there's a large number of people that will always want to do that. And, and our job is not to say we want to disrupt what's there. It's, our job is to say, what do the consumers want to do and make sure they can do it right then. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think 
or take it a step further, I don't think we're going to be using the term SVOD or talking yeah. about SVOD services you know, for, for too much longer in the future. I mean, there's, let me ask, of all the people that raised their hand before saying that they have at least three services, how many of you, is Amazon one of them? Is Prime one of them? And I bet none of you feel that you're actually paying for Amazon Prime because you're paying for the Prime delivery, not the Prime video, right? So right there, Amazon is already doing what the future is going to be, which is a bundling of services, right? You see you know, various elements of this, Hulu and Spotify. You know, for students was a great example, again, where they've targeted a, a specific audience uh, or, uh, or that, that has interest in both and created an offering for that. Um, you know, Time Warner, AT&T, they were doing, uh, you know, a game of, uh, sorry, not Game of Thrones, HBO uh, for free in an unlimited data plan. I think you're going to see more and more of that. I think you'll see a lot of that with gaming and potentially with betting at some point in the future. But you're, you're again, you're going to come back to a couple services that you're subscribing to that are giving you more of what you want, and it won't feel like you're subscribing to a single video service. Um, Peter, we just saw Netflix came out with... Um Bandersnatch. Now, I am a huge Black Mirror fan, just so we're on the same page. Um, so I, I immediately went and dove right in to um, what was essentially, for those of us, I see a few of us here um, that grew up in the 80s, was an online version of a choose-your-own-adventure book, which was, I think, something I dreamed of um, in New Jersey in, like, 1986. So um, your thoughts? Is that, like, did you, did you watch it? Let's ask first, ask, did you like it? Um, uh, yeah, so I did watch it. Okay. Uh, I thought it was very well done. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about uh, the show Bandersnatch, and, um, including our head of content and other creators. And I think it's a pretty fascinating technology. Uh, the thing that's so interesting about Bandersnatch, it's a choose-your-own-adventure uh, capability and the story is choose your own adventure so it's a little meta it would be really more interesting to see if you could really control a story that wasn't about a story controlling a story so I I think um, if creators have a great story that they want to unfold I, I don't know if it's gonna really scale you know okay. I'm not sure if this will be the future of all entertainment because telling one story linearly is already hard enough to say right. well here's one story that could go in all these different directions and have them all be equally compelling, I think that's going to be challenging. But uh, the technology, the fact that it exists and it works yeah. so elegantly, I thought was really cool. And it's just, um, it's one of those experiments that I think we'll see more and more of, you know, all those form functions that we're so used to, uh, really those legacy forms, there's no reason that we have to be married to them. Um, and to quote um, Rashad Dabakawala, as you know, the, th the thought leader at Publicis, he elegantly said that the future doesn't fit into the vessels of the past, but here we are still talking about half-hour comedies and hour-long dramas. Uh, so the faster you can recognize the fact that this explosion of bandwidth and, and all these capabilities and technology allows storytellers to really break those, um, those, those forms. I think that's what's so exciting. And, and the, a really bright, shining example was Bandersnatch. And I guess I mean, maybe for anyone on the panel, I think I know, Jeff, you have a, a large technology team in your group, so maybe if you want to answer. The thing that I found interesting from a, a techie geek perspective is that it wasn't a video player. Not that we traditionally think of a video player. When I touched the screen, a little line didn't come up that says play, pause, back 15 seconds, forward 15 seconds, and gave me some options of how I could control the content. Maybe I went to, to get the popcorn out of the microwave and I came back and I was like, okay, now what do I do? There was no choose your own adventure to go back to three minutes before I got up out of my chair, which was pretty frustrating. So, you know, if all of a sudden all these storytellers came out and were, you know, forward thinking and not stuck with the, um, the, um, uh, the shackles of the past. You know, are there enough developers with enough skills to create interactive video experiences at scale for over-the-top platforms? I mean, I think we will. I think that's the, I, I think the things that, that we focus our engineering talent on now um, are becoming more and more, I mean, I always tell people the, the most important decision you can make in technology is not what you build, but what you don't build. Because if someone else is doing it, um, and they're doing it well, and Amazon's a great example with their, you know, the, the idea that you'd have a data center now is just almost crazy, uh, but 10 years ago it wasn't, and I think that it's like a rising tide, and you sit on that tide, and you keep going up, and you take your talent, and you focus it on whatever, whatever isn't commoditized, 
and more and more stuff is commoditized. So I think there'll be enough engineering talent to do that. I think there's more and more people going into that field as well. Um, but it is a difficult challenge. And, it, and, and, the, and the interesting thing is we come up, and I've seen this many times, I'm sure everybody on the stage has, is you come up with what you know is going to happen a long time before it actually happens because it never works right at first. And you, know, you look at a company like Hulu, which is, is one of my favorite, I'm not just saying this, I'm sitting next to somebody that might hit me, but one of my favorite user experiences, um, but it wasn't always. <laughs> you see? That worked. Uh, I got my free subscription with ads. Um, uh, but it, you know, it, it wasn't always perfect, and it's certainly getting better and better. And, and the, 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 the exper experiment that was, uh, it isn't perfect, but it will be perfect. And I think that you just have to, you know, it, it, it always takes longer than you think uh, for things like that to proliferate. Yeah, and I don't, I don't need, know that it needs to be at scale, right? If the costs and the complexities come down, right, and it's mm -hmm. easier and easier for people to leverage a platform, uh, then the right producers with the right shows, the right talent will, will get it done. And it may be in different formats. You know, uh, Westworld did a really interesting uh, audio uh, experiment, um, you know, on Alexa, where, again, you could choose all these permutations and go through that experience. And, um, you know, they did that because the audience of Westworld, obviously, was going to engage in that. And it was a perfect right. execution. It didn't need to be across every HBO show, really just the ones where you know an audience would appreciate it and engage. Interesting. All right, well, we're going we're gonna to stay tuned, and um, you know, we're going to see how this evolves, and maybe next year we can come back and, and continue. But before we do, let's talk about sports. So I know, obviously, David here is, is from Turner. Turner has a, a very large portfolio of sports assets. I think a lot of folks in the media space, when you talk about um, where it's going, and, and some of us consultants try to say what's important or not important, we immediately latch on to uh, sports rights. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna ask David, you know, how important is sports to a company like Turner? And uh, we're gonna let you help us, you know, think through or give us your um, thoughts around. Will we see any big migration in sports rights from traditional players to the likes of a Facebook um, or Apple or Amazon? So will we see Monday Night Football um, in our Facebook feed next year? Um, and not on ESPN, or, or you know, I know those those rights are coming due. So let us know. Yeah, it, it's a well. First of all, sports are hugely important to our our business and many of the others that are here. Um, you know, there's there's obviously been a lot of uh, investment or, or certain experimentation from Fang, you know, in the sports world, and I think that will continue. Um, but one of the challenges that we're all going to face is that sports still drives a tremendous amount of live viewership and engagement. More than just the viewership, it's the engagement. But even we recognize that, you know, there's going to be people that tune into the NBA on TNT, but we know that there's a certain percentage of those people that may be watching Netflix or something else there. But if we're able through our Bleacher, Li Bleacher Report Live app, you know, ping them with the notification that their favorite teams are in the fourth quarter and they have an opportunity to buy that game for 99 cents right there then on the spot, you know, that's another opportunity to engage that fan and keep that fan within, within our ecosystem. And so when you think about how expensive sports rights could get, the calculus of whether you choose to invest or not is going to be based in, in many ways on how are you going to be able to leverage your, your, your platform overall. So now that we're part of the AT&T family, with 170 million devices worldwide, when we think a lot about that, how can we work across the entire portfolio? You saw that a little bit with uh, the match with Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson, which uh, we live streamed, we had on cable, across Dish and others, uh, sorry, DirecTV and others, and we, um, you know, th that's just a good example of bringing all of the assets together to promote something. I think companies in general are going to have to work harder for that live viewership uh, and, and get as much engagement across the platforms as they can. And that, again, to, to, to Fang, may be a little more challenging uh, as they are currently structured in the distribution that they have, which is significant, uh, but it's usually singular, singular points of distribution. I think, I think there's also a, uh, the, the rights owners, so the leagues themselves, care a lot, um, not just about how much money they're going to get for this year's rights, but what is the breadth of the distribution and how pervasive is it? Because they've learned over time, and they're right, that if everybody can't see it, then over time the value of the sport goes down. And so, um, and, and, and the production value of, a, of, I mean, what we find at Fox is the production value of an NFL game goes a long way. Um, I think what's going to end up happening, and I could be wrong about this, um, is that, this, that, that, that the leagues will begin to do non-exclusive deals with other distribution models and see, like with Facebook or whoever, and it, it, it will no longer be, and, and they'll require, which we do now, I think for Amazon, uh, Thursday Night Football, they have a simulcast of our production, 
Um, and that was part of, part of the deal we had to do in yeah. order to get Thursday Night Football. So I think you'll see more and more of that, but I, I, I don't see them going away from the, the, the ubiquitous distribution of, of, of sports. I guess let's just ask one question. I don't know if he'll answer, but Peter, in the boardroom of Hulu, how often outside of Hulu Live do people bring up, like, hey, let's go get some sports rights? Ever? Uh, you know, at Hulu, we're trying to take advantage of um, our capability to serve the fan. So within Hulu Live, for example, for the Olympics, we let people uh, select which sports they wanted to get pushed towards them. Um, World Cup, same kind of an idea. So when it comes to sports, I think, you know, when you talk about all the big interactive companies, when, when they think about the opportunity, they think about a way of delivering it that is more personal. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is an opportunity uh, for consumers to enjoy it in a new way. Uh, and that's why I think those companies all are attracted to it. Um, and with that said, I'm going to not answer the rest of your question. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> on, on Facebook, there are so many conversations happening about sports all the time. And the engagement is insane. If any of you guys are Bronco fans, um, that is where people are going to talk about their sports and what's going on. I find out a lot of times from my hometown what's going on in the games and which friends are at the games, et cetera, on Facebook. So we really want to take advantage of that conversation and help our partners who are creating that great content, who are part of that content, to be able to get that distribution and get the conversation that's going to actually amplify it beyond just a single point of distribution. Interesting. And I think so, what Dave said was really interesting, the idea of being able to tune into a game late and for 99 cents go piecemeal. Right. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how many different business models uh, emerge. I read this amazing story about some of the things that are happening in China. Like, uh, there's a model where you can read up to two thirds of an ebook before you pay for it. It's like, all right, am I really going to pay for it after two thirds of the book? Or, you know, they're so mobily centric and so credit card light that you pay with everything with your phone. And at the end of a podcast, you can tip the podcaster, and the average tip is like 14 cents. But if everybody has the opportunity to give tips, like all these new business models around the yeah. world, I think could um, seep into places like sports and really unlock um, monetization for the leagues and uh, people who pay for the rights. I think, well, listen, that makes a ton of sense. Clearly, we saw earlier this year, I think it was this year, that the um, Supreme Court, you know, made sports books legal in the United States, basically. Um, they've been legal in the rest of the world for a long time. So, you know, and I, I heard a stat once um, that about 80% of the betting that happens in the rest of the world, which is a tremendous amount, happens in-game. Doesn't happen before the game or after the, you know, obviously not after the game, because that'd be awesome. That'd be a good business <laughs> for the person betting. Anyway, let's move on. So I know that everyone is at CES. It's their, likely their third or fourth day at CES. So I'm sure you all have loads of energy. You're all excited to, to, to get to wherever you're going to after this. But I know that means you came here just to hear the obligatory question around virtual reality. Right? And I'm going to ask all of our panelists to answer a question about virtual reality so you can hear their thoughts about it. But I'm going to, I'm going to make a little bit of cliffhanger. And first, I'm going to ask um, Selena to talk about that social experience because exactly. you alluded to it before. Live up to and what I thought. So why don't you help us understand, like, what is the future of social viewing on platforms like Facebook? Yeah, well, we aren't all in Oculus headsets watching TV together yet. I don't know if we will. But our first step into what does the social experience in TV or video viewing look like is Facebook Watch. And has any of you watched Facebook Watch? All right, we've got a few. Um, it's a really great experience to go and check out if you have not to see how we're stepping into this space and testing and figuring this out. So the real intent of what we built was to allow fans to connect directly with creators and to spark conversations on video and to build communities communities around great content that people are really interested in, their passions. If you think about how much time we spend in front of a screen, last time I checked mine, it was two hours today. The amount of video we're watching solo, we really want to get people into an experience where they can actually connect with somebody while they're doing that because we spend so much time with our phones these days. A great example of this is Red Table Talk, which includes uh, great talent, Jada Pinkett Smith. And they're really bringing to life this show with three great functionalities. One, in the group on Facebook, you'll see 
conversation between the creators of the show, including Jada, her daughter, her mom, and getting input from the fans about what they're actually going to talk about. So it's created with fan input. Second, they're doing a lot of live video. And in that live video, you can interact, fans can interact, people that are not obviously in the show talking, but can interact with people in real time. And then lastly, we're creating communities by allowing people who really love this show to get together in a watch party and talk about it amongst themselves. So there's so many conversations and legs that this actually brings to an experience when you can make it beyond just one person sitting in an airport, because we're all gonna do this later, looking at video on our mobile phones. So that's our first foray really into what that can be. And in Oculus, we're testing different things, but until all of us again have our Oculus headsets, that's gonna be a longer journey. Let's talk about VR. I mean, everyone was waiting for it, right? Um, we're going to start with Selena again and go down the path. VR, I mean, I guess you could say a couple words about it. You could also just say thumbs up or thumbs down, right? Like, like let us know what you really think about virtual reality. Definitely thumbs up. We're starting with augmented reality before we get to virtual reality. And today on the Facebook platform, whether you're using an Oculus or your mobile phone is really the point of entry, we have a lot of content that's created that can actually read something out in the real world and augment to that, whether that's an ad or content created specifically for that. So augmented reality, being able to look in this room, use our mobile phone and add information and components to it will be the first, the first way it goes. Yeah, I agree with you, Selena. And um, I think it's still a, a longer putt for entertainment. I think it's uh, much more likely to see real world, real world applications that inform and educate people. I think VR in particular is probably more B2B in terms of like real estate applications where you can see buildings before they're built or travel destinations where you wanna understand what you know, the resort looks like before you're going. And those are very practical applications. Entertainment's mm -hmm. still a little bit down the road, I bet. Um, sports could be another one, but that will re require 5G. We'll be swimming in 5G, and then real-time VR could probably... Swimming in 5G. Yes, yes. That's awesome. Can, so, I, can I ask just for one more thing? Because you probably see more... Um, I won't call them cool things, because I'm sure sometimes you walk out of the room going, what was that? but you see newer things. Have any, has anyone come in and tried to show you any kind of cool tech for ad products? Dynamically ad inserted things in a VR or anything that's like, like yeah, you thought of was interesting? There's a lot of ideas around um, shoppable ads, um, shoppable content. I think mm -hmm. that's a big flavor. Um, you know, the idea of um, integrations in the real, in you know, broadcast table, cable, whatever, long form shows, um, the idea of uh, virtual, uh, product placement, and then someone's like, we're going to do programmatic virtual product placement. It's like, let's just start with virtual before we go with programmatic. Right. Um, uh, so we've seen some of those examples. Again, within the conventional space, the interactivity, a lot of uh, interesting ideas there as well. So I think, I, I think I agree with everything that's been said in terms of, I think VR is, is, is here to stay, but I'm not sure for entertainment and sports. I think it's more likely to, to catch on with sports first. And most big innovations in viewing do happen in sports because people are so passionate about it and it attracts large groups of people and you want to differentiate yourself. I think the problem is, you know, when you, everybody thought a long time ago that 3D was going to be huge and, and, and it wasn't in the home primarily because you had to put glasses on. Um, and every bit of research that we ever did or anybody ever did, it, that was the problem. And, it, and they weren't quite as um, uh, invasive as perhaps the uh, VR headsets would be. Um, and so I think until, until that problem is solved, and I do think it will be solved, it's not, personally from an from a entertainment point of view or an a in-home viewing point of view for long-form content, whether it's sports news or, um, or entertainment, um, I think it's a long way off, if ever, becoming mass market in the home. Interesting. Um, but as I said before, you know, everybody thinks these things are going to happen, and then it takes forever, and then all of a sudden they just catch on. And I can see that happening with VR. I just don't think we're, I don't think it's just around the corner. Right, all the tech has the hype and then the cooling off and then somewhere down the road, you resume this normal growth curve. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure exactly where we, I know we're over the hype. Right. And I don't know if we've resumed the normal growth curve, but it's there was probably some, There was some Bill Gates quote out there once that, you know, any technology is over, overinflated in the first X number of years and then completely underestimated in the following 10. 
right? So the question is, when do we get to that following 10? And then it feels like it catches on overnight. I mean, it really does. So I think, I just, I just think it's a long way off. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, as has been said, very genre specific. I do think where it could catch on faster is the kind of co-viewing experience again. So the ability, particularly around sports or live events, award shows, things where, I mean, even red carpets where people can view across the country with their friends. Uh, again, I'll go back to the, the potential sports betting. Imagine you can have you know, bets being posted within your own sort of viewing environment and uh, in your own little leaderboards, but it's very genre specific. On the, um, the VR side for ad insertion stuff, I have seen a company recently company called Triver, and they are working on that exact issue, that, that exact question of how do you insert virtually, you know, not get deep into the code and slow it down. And those things, I mean, people are going to be developing those technologies again, making it easier and easier and reducing those barriers. On the AR side, um, again, bringing utility. Um, we were talking to some of the guys at Live Nation the other day, and they're doing some really interesting things with AR overlays at the concerts. Uh, cool. And you imagine just again in between sets, the, the stage all of a sudden becomes a new screen. Uh, there's utility from an AR standpoint of being able to literally find in big festivals where is so-and-so playing, which, what's going on, and how do you get over to that area. But there's also a new screen, new ad opportunities. So I think you know, when you find true utility, that's when you see the adoption because everybody benefits. Super interesting. I'm excited to see what it comes. David, we, talked, we started this day with like what works or what do consumers want. Um, help us understand where the, the, the big challenges are. Right, so this OTT stuff is, um, is magnificent, is exciting. We have seen lots of challenges over the last um, five years, you know. Yeah, well look, on, on the technical side, anybody that's been in, in live, and live's been around for a long time, live always has risk, right? And as technology gets better, as processes get better, you'll see less of that, but there will always be challenges when you're doing big, huge scaled events. Um, that's not gonna change, but, but you'll see probably less and less of that. Um, what we spend more time thinking about, again, with so many services going to be available, how do you differentiate? Some of the research that we also saw was that um, you know, one size model, one size all models don't, aren't gonna work in the future, right? And that UI, UX in particular uh, are really important. And I just this, over this holiday break, my uh, mother asked me to help her with something on her computer and I opened it up and literally was starting to shake looking at the desktop with about 400 files across the spread across the desktop. Remind me never to open up my computer in front of you. Yeah, I mean, that sort of clutter like makes me nervous, but to her, that's fine. And then if you then think about an SVOD service or anything, you go back to Google when Google first came out and it was such a simple, clean interface. And everybody said, thank you. Thank you for just making that clean to start. You know, the research has shown us, particularly in the SVOD stuff, that people want the opportunity to declutter. You know, they want to be able to select out of things. Why am I still seeing horror recommendations if I've never watched horror? Why do I need to scroll this far? How can I literally clear the screen? And so I think as everybody races to get products out, as new innovations come out, you know, how are you able to really personalize that UI UX? Uh, and again, there's certain scale issues that you have to deal with there, but we're going to have to move to that model because uh, people are different. They consume differently. Jeff, I know, I know you, again, we talked about a second ago, you have a big technology team. What keeps you up at night? When it's time to broadcast their, you know, live stream the Super Bowl. Yeah, um, I was going to talk about the Super Bowl. I mean, I think the, the issue that, that all, of, all of us have is that the, the, the infrastructure that's in the country and, and all the companies grows at the pace of normal viewing. So over the top is growing very, very fast. Um, and every time, every time we are able to all of us, all companies are able to get themselves to a level where they can handle the normal demand, a big event comes along and almost always there's something that happens. Uh, the Super Bowl is, or, or the Olympics, and you know, we start planning for the Super Bowl and NBC will start planning for the Olympics or whoever has them now, um, you know, years in advance because you're, you're actually planning for a scale that isn't gonna hit uh, the over the top or the, or the internet uh, for a couple of years into the future and therefore the normal infrastructure isn't there to handle it. It's just that one day. And so that's really what keeps us all up at night. It's, it's how, how do we plan for uh, both the known and unknown, and it's the unknown unknowns, to quote Mr. Rumsfeld, that are the worst uh, things, because you, you, you could never know. We had a, a problem one time because a clock reset during an ad break. Like, that wasn't something that we had tested uh, or even knew might happen, um, and it brought things down for a minute, and everybody panicked, and we were like, how the hell did that happen? We tested for six years. <laughs> um, but there's always something, and there always will be, and that keeps everybody up. All right. One last question, and then the speed round. Um, and then we will declare a winner. 
and we'll go to the audience questions. Um, so, Peter, I've had the, the luxury and pleasure of seeing you speak at more than a couple of these things. Um, and, and I've heard you say this before, which is we are 100% addressable over at Hulu, right? And it usually comes in some format where there's um, some, some person who's been in TV for 30 years trying to explain why addressable television isn't a thing and not necessary or whatever it is. And um, you're, you're taking the next question and, and that's where you start. So help us understand addressable TV, why it's important, you know, why you say you're 100% addressable and, and why everyone should care. Well, I think uh, it's easy to understand that we're 100% addressable because every single person is watching us through an IP address. I mean, the benefit of addressable advertising is that um, you can serve the right ad to the right person at the right time. And in conventional TV terms, they talk about household A right next door to household B could have a very different makeup of the people, the income, the ages, all that good stuff, and they should get different ad experiences. And the ad experiences are like snowflakes uh, at Hulu. Every single person gets their own ad experience. And uh, so therefore, to me, it, it's, uh, it's all addressable. You know, and depending on if, when you're watching a show, you could be um, someone, uh, we could serve you that based on your gender, your geography, your age, uh, you know, the weather, whatever it is. So it's very, very personalized. And the benefit of that, of course, is you eliminate um, serving ads to people who aren't interested in your products and services, so the advertising just works better. Okay. I mean, it's as simple as that. And um, it's funny when you talk, I, I see broadcast and cable guys uh, talking about the percentage of, of viewers who are addressable, and it's just pretty easy at Hulu. It's 100%. And I think everything we're doing today is, is exactly what the whole TV ecosystem will look like in the future. I don't know if it's sooner or later, but it's almost inevitable that all of TV will be served through an IP address sooner or later, or with the advent of ASTC3. Yes, um, little Scotty 222? Yeah. Okay, right? yeah. exactly. So um, all those technologies four, will enable it to come faster and advertising will be more effective and more personalized. And awesome. then when it's effective and relevant and personalized, hopefully it'll be more um, accepted and people will, uh, you know, say, no, advertising is entertaining and, and informative and uh, we don't have to worry so much about these commercial free environments. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna ask one question. We're gonna have three questions in our speed round. We're gonna start at Selena and go this way. There's real quick and easy to show how this works. Question one, you just have to answer quickly and go down the thing. We have like a minute and a half before we have to turn it over to our, our audience. So question one, what was more impressive, helicopters that are drones or dryers that fold laundry for you? Helicopters that are drones. Really? I don't, laundry? I mean, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> uh, uh, drones. Drones. Laundry. <laughs> drones. Okay. I have to say, like, the drone is just a supersized version of, like, the remote control car I had when I was in high school. So, like, a dryer that folds its clothes for me, that is a, something I have never seen um, ever in my life. Okay, next quick question. I don't care whether it's Bixby. Do you guys know what Bixby is? That's great. I'm glad because we have colleagues here from Samsung. Um, Alexa or OK Google, what is your favorite thing to ask your personal voice assistant in your house? Play me the daily show. Mm. Trevor Noah has these amazing outtakes and I wake up to that in the morning. Okay. It's boring, but I, I like it to give me the weather. <laughs> that is, actually, that is, that is pretty boring, but you know. Slightly we, more boring, I usually ask it what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, you, you haven't beat Pete. <laughs> Not an issue. I, I don't use it that often, but when I have, it's worked, which is there's an app that um, uh, helps your kids brush their teeth at really? night. So it, 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 I'm forgetting the name of it now, of course, so I'd, I'd fail the test with them, but it literally gives about 90 seconds that capture your kid's attention telling a small story, and they just brush their teeth, and in the middle of the story, like, now really? go to the top, now go to the bottom, and you just sit there, and you're like, they're actually brushing their teeth. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much. Listen, we have um, close to nine minutes left. <clears throat> if there are any questions from the audience, now's the time. We'd love to hear them. Check, check, check. So we do have a microphone. This is actually a throwable microphone, so if uh, the person that wants to speak next is close, go ahead and toss it to him. Otherwise, you can throw it back to me, and I'll move it on to the next person. 
Just speaking to the ex. Feels like a liability issue. Hi. Oh, wow, that's really loud. Um, my name's Leah Shude. I work at NDX, and I have a question for you in regards to interactive technology. So Netflix kind of proved that with Bandersnatch, people want to pick up their remotes and engage with their content. Are you guys looking at ways to engage your viewers by giving them some device or means to do so? Well, I would just say I don't think Netflix proved anything. This has been going on for 10 years. Um, you know, there's been interactive TV. Um, you know, one that comes to mind was uh, Hashtag Killer, a, a, a show on Suits, uh, you know, where you literally could choose the ending depending on um, a live vote. Uh, award shows, you've been, been doing voting in award shows for awards or best dress and things like that. Um, so and it's, not a, it's not a slight at Netflix, I would just say, Absolutely, it just comes down to, again, uh, what's the real payoff for their fan? Is it, is it really something they want? Is it the right genre, uh, the right cost? Is it ad-sponsored? Are we doing it ourselves? Um, so I'm pretty bullish that there will be more, more interactive elements. Um, you'll see a lot out of, uh, of platforms like Facebook as well, or platforms that natively allow you to do that. But all the traditional companies, and again, be our live being a good example, we're giving you know, good ways for fans to interact directly on our platform. So without a doubt, you'll see more of it. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe to be a little more clear, were you looking at ways to do this in a, in a sense that actually monetizes that content and those opportunities? Because well, I think I the commercial think space is ripe for interactive uh, interactivity. We've done over 100 campaigns with Brightline that have interactive elements, whether it's just a simple photo gallery or a video gallery or a quest for information. So I, I think that marketers will continue to understand that they can exploit that interactivity, and all of that is absolutely uh, commerce-centered. And the mobile phone will very quickly be your entrance into that interactivity, whether that's through the camera and connecting to real-world things that are static, and soon enough, as soon as the technology is ripe, in your TV screen or other screens. Um, okay. A lot of pressure. Testing one, two. Um, yeah, this is a question for uh, Sonia. Is that, it's okay. So this, from a practical standpoint, uh, Facebook consumer experience, um, I'm trying to figure out what you, like your ad strategy, ad insertion strategy is, because uh, I'm a heavy Facebook user, but when a nice little video comes up that's maybe five minutes long or something like that, and I start watching it, and I get really into it, and then all of a sudden an ad pops up and disrupt, it's an unnatural insertion, and then I totally disengage. So I'm wondering if you could speak to the strategy, what's going on there, am I missing something? Because it's like when you start talking about your product, I'm, I'm just like, there's no way I'm gonna watch TV or anything on Facebook because they keep getting in the way, either do it at the beginning or at the end. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity to so. Yes, thank you for that question. Yeah. We're really at the beginning stages of figuring out what that should look like. So the more you don't watch that video, the more we know that and can create a different experience over time. But I would say we're at the beginning stages. We like to say we're 1% done. I'd say we probably are around that with our watch platform and our video platform, and we're figuring that out. <laughs> Not going to throw it all the way over there. Hi, David, I have a question uh, regarding your e-league. Uh, now that eSports has become extremely popular, especially here in Vegas, especially here in Vegas, um, with nightclubs closing down for the arenas and the championships, I remember watching two years ago an e-league championship. Um, and your, your advertising and your promotions with NBA and Turner um, are outstanding. Are you going to do anything more with the E-League in terms of uh, bringing it more to the forefront? Well, 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 thank you for the question and bringing up a topic that is a big one, which is eSports. And yes, Turner got, got involved very early, you know, making a bet that, that you were going to see the 
sort of largest aggregation of audiences around a particular genre in a very, very long period of time. You're seeing that with esports. Um, you're seeing a lot of things have had to happen with esports in the last couple of years. There needed to be more structure um, in, in, in the value chain. And you've seen a little bit of that with Activision Blizzard, you know, launching their own leagues for Overwatch. And with that structure, it brings more money in. And with more money, uh, more stability, easier for advertisers to kind of connect and, and plug in instead of a one-off. You know, they can really sort of plan against, uh, plan against the buy and plan against the year. Um, I couldn't comment specifically right now, but I would say definitely it's an area that Turner continues to be very, very excited about. Um, and, and a lot of the others on stage here, you know, have content or have done things uh, related to that. So Turner's definitely, definitely bullish on it overall. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of that attention uh, in, in a daily, you know, environment be sucked up by things like esports, which are in fact, you know, quite interactive by nature. Anyone else? Hello. Yes, I was wondering uh, if you are exploring or uh, looking forward to um, learn and um, use a blockchain technology uh, in the future. Yes. So I we've talked about it and what you've seen in terms of um, Facebook talking about blockchain and the interest there, but there's nothing that isn't public that uh, we have to comment on at the moment. But. It is an interesting technology, and it will shape how we do things moving forward as people, as industries. Yeah, I think with the proliferation of different um, services going straight to consumers, uh, the, the, it will become important uh, to have a, 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 a single version of the, the, the truth, and especially with the, the intense focus on rights and rights management. But again, it's 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 a little bit a little ways off, I think. Um, but everybody's always looking at it because. It's got so much buzz around it. If you're not looking at it, you're afraid you're going to miss something. Yeah, it's definitely not my director of expertise, but I've seen it come up quite a bit when, with regard to, to rights management, with personal data, subscription services, even the entire you know, sort of ad ecosystem and, and kind of tracking dollars and tracking data across the value chain. Um, just there's smarter people that are working on it than, I, than myself. Thank you. Great panel. My question goes back to esports and part of the great thing for our brand is in fact that you have so much interaction with the stars who don't have what the NBA or the NFL players have, their own millions of Instagram uh, followers in regards to that they have their own individual brands. And the NFL and the NBA have done a great job of making stars. However, with uh, eSports, it's because of the time spent and the interaction that you can actually have with someone who plays for a long time. Do you see future contracts with NBA and the NFL to have more access and to own more of an individual player's brand? I, I think so. I mean, I think the... Um with esports, I mean, we're, we're I, I didn't say anything because I agreed with everything that, that was said, but the, the, the stars of esports do have their own brand and there's a lot more time spent with them, but they make a large amount of money as well. And, um, and I think that that will drive more and more people towards that model. Um, I think that there will be uh, normal sports athletes to have the same sort of, uh, uh, not the same sort of, but more personal relationships with the fans. They don't have the time to do to sit and, and play all day long and have people watch them, um, and I think it's physically probably not possible. But I, but I do think there'll be more experiential relationships with actors, with sports stars, with everyone, um, because that's what consumers want. And and if we do our job properly, we should be delivering things that consumers want. Awesome. Yeah, I would just add that you know the um, the activity of of players, whether it's esports or or football or basketball, off court or off match. Um, you know, is increasingly, uh, it, it's, it's the type of content that consumers really want to engage with. We see that with House of Highlights, with other things. You know, the player associations, uh, not just the leagues, uh, recognize this as well and are looking for opportunities to obviously uh, support the players and, and help them make money. It's not always the top stars, but uh, the others that are further down on the roster. So as leagues and, and in esports in particular get more organized, um, you will see, I think you'll see more structure that, that allows you to, to cut deals like that. Awesome. 
Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. So um, thank you very much. We hope you stay for the next panel. It's one of my colleagues who will be moderating. They have a great set of, of folks to talk about the future of advertising. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>